Hi folks, welcome back. This video is about proofs. Your first task is to assess this argument. So pause your videos now and decide whether you think this argument is valid or not. The second thing I want you to do is then defend your answer with a proof. So imagine that your friend didn't believe uh, your assessment, whether it's valid or invalid. What would you say to them? How would you convince them that you are right? Um, that's what I wanna know. So pause your videos now and see if you can figure this out. Okay, that was your chance to pause your videos. This argument is indeed valid. Um, so those premises do entail that this conclusion is true. The question is, how would you prove to somebody that that's the case? What would you say to them in order to convince them? Um, here's, in this little box here, I give you an example of proof. So this is what I would say. Here's a proof. Um, first, notice this, M and N have to be the same object, N equals N, so those things are identical. N and C are also identical, and that's just from premise number five. And now if I know those two things, then by transitivity of identity, if M equals N and N equals C, then M has to equal C. Then, since I know M equals C, I just look at premise number two here. K is also equal to C, so that means M has to equal K. I can just chain up a long sequence of these identity sentences to eventually show that M equals K. So why does this thing count as a proof? Well, this is the concept of what a proof is. It's just a demonstration that an argument is valid or invalid. Notice the proof is not the same thing as the argument. So whether the argument is valid or not is one thing, but to give a demonstration of it, that's a kind of act that we do. That's something that uh, we as logicians do. It's not something that the argument itself does. So think about a demonstration as a kind of explanation. It's just like the thing that you would explain to your friend. Now, not any demonstration is a good one though. So what constitutes a proper proof, a good proof? Well, it's a, it's a demonstration that's broken into little baby steps. And each one of those steps has to meet two criteria. Each step should actually be obvious. So if somebody doesn't believe the, the argument is valid, you should walk them through with enough small steps so that they can actually follow along and that it's obvious to them. And then secondly, additionally, every step has to be valid. So if you had invalid steps in your proof, even if your argument is valid, even if your assessment is right, if your proof makes invalid inferences then your proof is still bad, it's not a good proof. So, uh, so these, are the two, these are the two criteria for every single step of your proof. Now, let me, let me point out something about the obviousness. See, what is obvious to one audience might not be obvious to another one. And so there's a kind of context sensitivity to proofs. What, can, what counts as a good proof uh, can vary from one audience to another. And as we become more sophisticated in this class, we can make quicker and quicker steps in our proofs. We can presuppose a whole lot of common knowledge because we know certain things. So, so what counts as a good proof might vary from one audience to another. And that's, that's not a defect of proofs, that's just, that's just a fact. We're gonna, we're gonna look at how proof systems like Boole work um, in order to, to deal with this complication, but this is a really important fact. Okay, now proofs have parts. So there's a lot of common steps and understanding what these super common um, types of proofs are is going to be essential. So let me just walk through a few. We're gonna call, one part of the proof is the start, the beginning. And that's just, every proof is gonna start with the word proofs. That's so your audience knows exactly what you're doing. And we always know whether you're giving a proof or not. Because giving an argument is one thing. That's just stating some premises uh, and a conclusion. Giving a proof is something quite different. Proofs also end in the same way. So we're always going to end our proofs with the word done. There's many other ways to end proofs. Sometimes people say QED for quad erat demonstrandium, if you uh, want to sound fancy. Uh, sometimes you, people just put a little box, either an empty or a filled in box. That thing is called the tombstone uh, in mathematics. There's many different ways of ending proofs. Another thing that a common maneuver in proofs, a common step, restating premises is really important because then your audience knows what you're using. Not every premise actually needs used in every proof. Remember augmentation. If this argument is valid, I could add a bunch of other irrelevant premises and it would still be valid. My proof doesn't have to use all that irrelevant information. In fact, you'll see good proof practice, elegant proofs, just use the fewest number of premises that they need. They don't use any extraneous information. So you're gonna probably have to restate to your audience exactly what information that you're gonna start your proof with. The next thing you might do in a proof is justify certain inferences. So I said transitivity of identity is the, is the logic of the identity relation that I was using there. That if 
if m equals n and n equals c, then n has, m has to equal c. We can take out the middle term there, and we know that m uh, is the same object as c. That's called the transitivity of identity. So what I was doing when I cited that was justifying that inter inference. Now, notice that the thing I'm justifying, m equals c, this is not my final conclusion, but it's a step I need along the way to get to my final conclusion. We call these things intermediary conclusions. And many complicated proofs, you know, if a proof is too easy, you don't even have to, you know, it could just take a couple of sentences and your, or your audience might just, the inference itself might be obvious and you don't need any proof. We need proofs oftentimes because the arguments are not obvious and we're, our proof is gonna be long and complicated. So we might have many intermediary conclusions. Almost always you need some intermediary conclusions or else the proof would be really quite trivial. Um, before we get to the end of the proof with the word done, we almost always restate our final conclusion as well and how we get to it. So, th so you'll, it's very common that right before the word done, you get to the final conclusion. Um, after all, that's why you're ready to stop. Now, those are the common parts in a proof. Um, and you'll see those in all sorts of proofs. Every proof will have these parts. But let me distinguish two types of proofs because we're gonna be doing proofs both formally and informally, and it's really important to keep this distinction in mind. Remember how we said that in our everyday lives, we use logic, that's the thing we call natural logic, and we distinguish that from formal logical systems. Well, we're gonna have a similar distinction in proofs. When we give proofs in our everyday lives, we're gonna call those informal proofs. Like the proof I just gave was in English, so that thing counts as a proof. Also though, we might give proofs in a formal language when we add this uh, proof system to Boole, um, which we have not done yet, but we're gonna do this soon, then we're gonna be able to do formal proofs in Boole, and that's gonna be according to some specific rules. The syntactic inference rules are part of that third component of Boole that allows us to do formal proofs in it. And those rules are gonna have names like intro and elim. In a sense, these rules codify in a system what baby steps are allowed in formal proofs. And that is gonna help us understand how informal proofs work. The proofs, but that doesn't mean all proofs have to be formal to be good. When we reason in English, it's not bad. In fact, this is what we really want our formal system to model and help us understand. So the proofs, the formal proof system in itself is not actually the fundamental goal. We wanna understand how we reason in our everyday lives and how we can do that uh, well or poorly. Okay. Uh, besides proofs in English being informal, there's going to be two types of those things. Um, when you give a proof that an argument is valid, like we just did, there's going to be a whole bunch of methods that you might rely on, um, and we'll talk some more about those. You can also give proofs that arguments are invalid, and that's going to be a specific type of proof that we call the counterexample. We're going to look at this in a separate video, so, I, so I'm going to set that aside for the time being. What I want you to do next is focus on this argument. So pause your videos now and decide whether this argument is valid and, uh, or not, and give me a proof of it. What would you say to convince somebody that this is valid? So pause your videos here. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you figured out that this argument is indeed valid. Um, a and B are, are the same height. Now C is just another name for A. A and C are the same object. B and D are the same object. So of course, if A is C, and B is D, then C and D have to be the same height. After all, those are the exact same objects referred to in premise number one, just with different names. So here's the proof that I gave. Now, what I want you to do is assess my proof. Tell me if you can identify what part of the proof this thing is here in red. <clears throat> so I gave you those, those common types or parts of proofs. How would you pick this proof apart and analyze its jobs? What's the sentence in red doing? Okay, that was your last chance to look back or use your memories. This is, this is restating a premise. In fact, this is restating two premises. So since A and B are the same size, so I'm using premise one there, and A and C, A equals C, I'm using premise two there, then we know that C and B are the same size. So what I'm doing is I'm restating those premises. And notice the signal word, since. This is one of the premise signals. So if you understand those premise and conclusion signals, you'll be much better at giving proofs and as well as recognizing the parts of proofs that other people are giving. Um, let me say, not every proof necessarily has every component in it. So what I did not do is I did not justify this in inference that, B and, that C and B are the same size. I didn't give you the rule. Um, I could have done that. So that rule was called the principle of identity. Um, when you're allowed to do substitutions, like if A and C are the same object, 
and A is the same size as B, then I know C is the same size as B. I'm just substituting C in for A there. That's called the principle of identity. I could have justified that inference by citing this. I could have inserted it here, or I could insert it here. We know by the principle of identity that C and B are the same size. So um, how, how specific you have to be, whether you have to include every single part of a proof, really, again, is gonna depend upon your audience. If, if you're in a context where we're using the principle of identity all the time, we all know that it's valid and we all use it a lot, then you might just presuppose your audience is follow, following you along here and you wouldn't have to say it. Notice, uh, uh, similarly, I didn't restate like which premise I was using. I could have said since A and B are the same size and then in parentheses put premise one and A equals C, premise two. So which level of specificity you need um, really, again, depends upon your audience and some of the conventions that we establish. Uh, in order to have some strict rules for you to guide you in constructing proofs as you learn those conventions, uh, a couple of things we're going to say that you always must do is start and end the proof the same way. Every proof is going to start with the word proof and it's going to end with the word done. And those conventions we're going to take for granted. Um, let me say also one last thing. Sometimes people are actually referring to parts of a proof and it's just um, maybe quick or not as explicit and you might have a hard time following it. For example, notice in this proof that we gave of the earlier argument, when we reached the final conclusion, we said, we similarly know that N equals K. And the thing I'm pointing out is the word similarly here is actually doing a job. This is justifying the inference. It's saying by the same inference uh, justification, by transitivity of identity, again, is how we know that N equals K. So the, so the word similarly here, if your audience is following along, they get what that word means. It just means by transitivity of identity again. So what each part of the proof is actually doing, sometimes you have to stop and think about it. It might be sort of subtle, but as long as your audience can follow you, then the proof is go going to count as a good one. Okay, thanks.